What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Russell Napier. Russell was on the podcast a year ago for what proved to be a very popular conversation about his book on the Asian financial crisis and the birth of what he has called the age of debt. Today's episode picks up where that conversation left off, building on the foundations of the post Bretton Woods system of flexible exchange rates and dollar hegemony to speculate on what comes next, on what the new order that is now being born will look like, how it will operate, and its implications for economies, industries, portfolios, and the role of the dollar in the new international monetary system. It's a conversation about inflation, war and geopolitics, and ultimately how to position oneself for a fundamentally new world where old assumptions about monetary policy, risk-taking, and the power and influence of governments to shape economic opportunities and to upend the lives and livelihoods of private citizens will need to be radically rethought. Understanding what this world will look like as it is coming into being can make all the difference between success and failure for investors. The second part of our conversation, which is available to subscribers only, looks to identify who the winners and losers of this new economic and political paradigm will be, as well as the asset classes, industries, and companies that will benefit from it. What is the mindset that investors must have when devising strategies that can successfully be used to preserve and grow capital in this new world? What will the security environment look like? How will commodities and access to them inform the reserve status of currencies? What will international trade look like? And how will relations between the United States, Russia, Europe, and China be affected by the changes that are currently underway? These are just some of the questions that we tackle in the second hour. Since this episode deals with markets and investing, it should be absolutely clear that nothing we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, I hope you all enjoy what is truly an expansive and forward-looking conversation with my guest, investor, historian, and author, Russell Napier. Russell Napier, the keeper and now host of the podcast of the Library of Mistakes. Welcome back to Hidden Forces. It's delightful to be back. You are now a podcast host too. How does that feel? <laughs> that feels uh, far too high profile for someone like me. <laughs> it's fantastic. I've listened to both. I think you've only released two episodes thus far, correct? The most recent of which was on the financial Cold War, if I'm not mistaken. It's a great podcast. You know, for anyone who hadn't heard our last episode, I made the point in the introduction that it is an essential piece of listening. Even as a standalone episode, it was one of our most popular episodes, but it's foundational to what we're going to talk about today. But before we do any of that, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about who you are for anyone that's new to you and to your work. And also tell us about your role as the keeper of the Library of Mistakes and what your new podcast is about. So, Dimitri, I'm a lawyer by training who accidentally got into the investment management business straight from university as a lawyer. So I didn't know anything at all about anything and I had to educate myself quickly. So the way I found to edu educate myself quickly was by reading lots of financial history. So over my 32-year career now, that is how I've sought to educate myself and obviously spending it with people who know what they're talking about helps as well. So my day job is to advise investment institutions on their asset allocations, which I've been doing since 1995. Uh, I run a course in finance, which is uh, available online called Advanced Valuation in Financial Markets. I'm a chairman of a listed company, which is a half a billion pound sterling listed company. Uh, I'm an honorary professor at two universities. I've written two books on financial history, and I run the Library of Mistakes, 
Uh, that's who I am. So basically, if you just say I advise professional investors on asset allocation and everything else is really ancillary to that, but I have a bias to believe that we can learn a lot from just by watching, as Yogi Berra said. In other words, there's lots for us to learn from financial history, its relationship with politics, geopolitics, psychology, philosophy. Uh, and I'm afraid a lot of modern finance and financial thinking has stripped all of those things out. And if we ever realized that those things were important, now is the time that we're realizing they're important. Well, you're a wonderful historian of financial history, and today's conversation is going to be about both financial future and also the future of the geopolitical order, which is also something that you've studied and talked about. You're also the publisher of the Solid Ground newsletter. And a couple of weeks ago, you, in your latest letter, you wrote, when regime change occurs, the greatest risk for any investor is to get all the right answers to all the wrong questions. Now, if that's true, and we're in a period of regime change, then what are those wrong questions that investors are asking themselves today? So the number one wrong question is, where will the central banks put interest rates? This has been the key question to ask now since about 1978, when Paul Volcker came to the Federal Reserve, and is now largely an irrelevant question. But it's the one that professional investors will spend most of their day talking about. Now, there's an ancillary host of other wrong questions, but they all stem from the same thing, a belief that we live in a market system, a belief that there's a link between interest rates and the rate of inflation. This is what we teach in finance, but financial history is very clear that those things are not always true, that we can move into a new system where these things are not true. We have moved into that system as part of the geopolitical change, but as part of a bigger change associated with debt. So the wrong question is really focused on the old system too much focus on central bankers because central bankers, in my opinion, are largely impotent. And that's what people haven't worked out yet. Okay. So help set this up for me. I'm not sure if we want to talk at first about the scale and scope of the problem that central banks have been dealing with for the last, at least, well, it depends where you want to start the, the clock. In our last episode, we started it with the Asian financial crisis. You could start it with the 2008 crisis, but this kind of financial repression that we've been living with, but that you call benign financial repression, has relied on monetary policy as its primary policy tool. What has been the nature of that regime, and why do you feel it is both no longer working and that looking at central banks and central bank policy is actually asking yourself the wrong question? And then, of course, that would lead us into a conversation about the, what the right questions to be asking are. Okay. So the, the old regime is really a regime where China in particular, but many other countries linked their currencies to the United States dollar. There were then huge implications from that, all of which tended to depress. Let's just talk about it in US terms. It's easier. Depress the rate of inflation in the US. So the central bankers believed they were fighting a problem which was too low inflation with a risk of deflation. That's the problem they believed that they were fighting. So they used their standard toolbox to fight that. And that is effectively low interest rates. Now, there's a side effect for low interest rates. It tends to create more debt because people like to borrow very cheaply. When the great financial crisis came along, they discovered that low interest rates wasn't enough. It just simply wasn't enough. So they then came up with a second part of the toolbox. And the second part of the toolbox is what we call quantitative easing, a massive expansion of the central bank balance sheet. But that has the same problem. It creates money, or sorry, it creates a particular type of money. It keeps interest rates too low and debt goes up again. So in those two phases, what has actually happened is that the debt to GDP ratio has gone up and up and up and COVID comes and it goes up again. And that's not just the US, that's the entire developed world. So they used what was in the toolbox and what the consequence of that is on a structural basis is to push the debt to GDP ratio for the entire US economy, so that is including the government, household sector, and non-financial corporates, to a level that has never been seen before in the history of the United States of America. So that was the old system, and now we're left in this horrible situation where we have to solve that problem, the problem of far too much debt. So it didn't have to be this way, but that was the, uh, that was the joy of central banking, that one target was pursued above all other, which was so-called price stability, and other targets, such as the level of debt to GDP and financial stability, were put in the back burner. So now we have to solve a different problem. And that's why we're moving to a different setting and a different structure and a different world order. So I think it was like uh, five years ago or five and a half years ago that you published a 
uh, yeah, it was Q3 of 2016 that looked at what possible triggers could bring about the next phase of financial repression. And you also pointed to what were then alarmingly high levels of debt to GDP. What has happened in the intervening years that has led us to this point where you think we are now either on the cusp of or in the process of transitioning to a new regime? Yeah, the first and most important thing is that the Federal Reserve policy or central bank policy in general did not create, until 2020, great growth in the supply of money. So if I really want to bring down debt to GDP ratio, I am going to need high nominal GDP growth. And therefore, I'm going to probably need uh, strong growth in, in broad money. It didn't achieve that. It failed to do that from 2009 to 2019, but it kept interest rates low. So what we had is fairly low growth in nominal GDP, which is real GDP plus inflation, but very high growth rate in debt. So from 2016 to 2019, the situation got worse because we simply didn't create the money supply growth and the inflation that would have helped bring this problem under control. And then, of course, we get the second problem, which comes in with COVID-19, which is another recession. And when I wrote the report in 2016, I said, just wait until the next recession. If you think debt to GDP is high now, just watch it go. And of course, this was a recession like no other. So debt to GDP really leapt up. So to be clear, this was not a call that this is all driven by COVID and the rise in debt to GDP associated with COVID. It was already too high. It was already going to happen. You need a catalyst. This was the catalyst after a prolonged period of time when central bank policy, supposed to be inflating away our debts, singularly failed to do so. So central banking had already failed. But like most regime changes, you keep going anyway, hoping somehow that the old toolbox will be sufficient. But it was absolutely crystal clear by the summer of 2020 that that toolbox was not going to be sufficient to solve this problem of excessive levels of debt. So why was it insufficient? And what were the effects of the type of financial repression that we've been living with for more than the last 10 years? So the reason it wasn't effective is that although most people believe that central bankers create money, that isn't correct. What the central banker tries to do is to control the commercial banking system. And its control of the commercial banking system is how it creates money. So think of it as a coachman or a coachwoman in a team of horses. It's not the coachman or coachwoman that pulls the carriage. It's the horses. But of course, the coachman or coachwoman tries to control where those horses go, how fast they go, what direction. So let's call those horses the commercial banks. So despite all the massive stimulus that the central banks provided with low interest rates and also providing lots of liquidity to those banks, those banks did not expand their balance sheets and therefore they didn't create this money, which is the the core of monetary policy. However, there was still the creation of plenty of debt because a lot of debt in America in particular, but now in other countries as well, is not created by banks. If I lend you $100 and I'm not a banker, then that's $100 of debt that's just been created. We didn't create any money. Had I been uh, sitting and lent you $100, I would have created money, but as I'm just me. So what we were doing is creating lots of debt in the bond markets and the money markets because interest rates were so low and people wanted to borrow, but we weren't creating a lot of money. So that was the failure of the, of the old system because it failed because it didn't get the banks to work. Now, the consequences of the financial repression that we've run for the past 10 years was a soaring debt to GDP ratio. That was the consequence of it. And very poor returns for bond investors, I mean, spectacularly so since 2020, but negative real interest rates for a long part of that, and much worse in other places like Germany uh, than the United States of America. So a small transfer of wealth away from bond investors or f- holders of fixed interest securities, but that really, really got underway in, in 2020. So that was the failure of central banking, its mechanism, its ability to control those horses for whatever reason didn't work. And we can, I can give you lots of reasons why perhaps it didn't work, but the point is it didn't work. So I just want to clarify something. When you say that we weren't creating money, is what you mean that we were creating reserves on bank balance sheets, but the banks weren't incentivized to lend those out and therefore expand the broader aggregate supply of money? That is absolutely right. And there are lots of reasons why maybe they didn't do that. Uh, but obviously, you know, they were blamed for the financial crisis. There was lots of pressure on them post the financial crisis. They were seen as the problem, not as the solution. So as the central banker tried to work through those commercial banks to create more broad money and inflation, there were lots of other pressures going on on capital adequacy ratios and regulation. That meant the banks themselves weren't really lending very much money. So it's still been a great time for asset holders. The stock market has done phenomenally well. 
we've managed this, what some people call a glorious deleveraging. I think Summers calls it a glorious deleveraging or, or a balance sheet uh, deleveraging for, again, the entire period post-2008. Why not just continue this process? Like, Why the change? Why do you think that, that a change is necessary or coming? Well, there is no beautiful deleveraging for the US economy as a whole. There is a beautiful deleveraging, if you like, for the household sector. So we have to divide the US economy into three. And for the household sector, the debt to GDP ratio has come down. And the household sector is in much better condition than it was in 2007. So that's one sector of the economy. It is absolutely not true to say that the US government has been through a beautiful deleveraging. It has seen its debt to GDP ratio going up. It's also absolutely not true of the corporate sector. And that has reached an all-time high, a record high. So there's a certain, if you like, rebalancing of leverage within the US economy during this period. But when you add all that together, you don't get a beautiful deleveraging. When you add the three bits together, it geared up. It didn't gear down at all. So well done to the US household sector. But the other two sectors, the government and the corporates, more than made up for the, the improvement that was going on in the household sector. Okay. So then why is leverage a problem? Why can't we just solve this problem by continuing to issue more debt? It seems to have been working just fine up until now. Well, we've had two recessions in the last uh, 12 years, both of which seem to, and I think genuinely did, take us close to a Great Depression. When we get a recession, cash flows decline, and the ability to service debt declines. And if you then get mass defaults on debt, you take you towards bank bankruptcies. Now, that's most easily and obviously associated with 2007 to 2009. But without the massive state intervention in 2020, almost certainly the same thing would have happened again. So I guess one of the reasons you would say one of the problems with debt is that when you get recessions, and they are inevitable, there is a real risk they can turn into depressions when debt is incredibly high, not dissimilar to 1929 to 1932. We all want to avoid depressions, obviously, because of the just the human consequences of depressions. But I think central bankers, it's seared into their memory that what came after the Great Depression was a world war. So there are great fears of social political dislocation associated with the Great Depression. So I think that's the reason that we want to bring down debt to GDP, because everyone is fearful that the next recession could tip us into the, another Great Depression. And that is why governments will target this. It is just worth saying to me too that we had very high debt to GDP ratios after World War II, and the government decided to inflate those away. So we were not happy to live with those levels. This was more of a European phenomenon than an American phenomenon. But when we've been here before, the reaction of government was, we need to get rid of this debt. We need to inflate it away, uh, either quickly or slowly. And there are different repercussions depending whether you do it quickly or slowly. But socially, this is a dangerous situation to be in. And therefore, historically, it has triggered a government reaction. So I believe your contention is that what we're going to see is a combination of financial repression and inflation as a way to reduce the relative debt burden on society. But the financial repression that we're going to experience is going to be radically different from the type that we have experienced thus far. My, I guess my first question is, why is that necessarily the case? Why can't some combination of austerity or maybe growth or even a hard default not substitute for financial repression and inflation? And then my second question is, what would that financial repression look like and why would it be so radically different than what we're used to today? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because I think you phrased it in a way that makes it very clear that it's a political choice, that there's no sort of invisible hand working here to give us a solution to this problem. It will be a political choice. Now, the question is, which answer do our politicians choose? Austerity, as you say, which is basically government not borrowing, even, even repaying its debt. Well, in the world that we live in today, which is a world of you know very big social policies, that would mean scaling those back. That is possible, but unlikely. We sort of tinkered with that after the great financial crisis, and the governments who tried it basically lost office. So austerity in terms of winding, but winding in the government is always an option, but it's not one that goes down well with voters as a generalization. Some voters like it, most don't. So I don't think that's the political choice. Default has been tried before. And when you go for default, it tends to produce a crushing contraction in your economy. Remember, one person's 
uh, liability is somebody else's asset. And if you go for the default, then people start losing great big chunks of their assets. They themselves might be geared and therefore they find themselves in problems. Remember that the really worst bit of the great financial crisis was triggered by what? A default by Lehman Brothers. A $606 billion default by Lehman Brothers was really cascaded around the entire system. So I think the lesson from that for policymakers is to be rather concerned about defaults and what that might do for the stability of the system. Uh, you can then use hyperinflation. I think we everybody listening to this knows what that is. It is technically 60% inflation a month, but that'll do it. That'll get rid of your debt burden pretty quickly. But as Lord Keynes famously said, that is a random reallocation of wealth, which not one man in a million can forecast. And it really is the roll of the dice. Socio-politically, you don't know where the dice are going to roll, uh, land if you, if you roll those. That leaves very high real growth as a solution, which is the one we would all dream of. For that, you need pretty high population growth and great productivity growth. And human beings are very inventive and very creative. And we'd have to hope that would come to pass. There's no evidence that, it, that it's there in the data for the last 10 years. It would have to be a productivity revolution. And then the only other way, the only other way is financial repression, which we can talk about a little bit more. So I'm really saying to you that one of those is probably impossible, which is the, the beautiful way of doing this, really high real growth. The other three are politically not going to be chosen, which leaves financial repression, which is a little bit more subtle. It's not as blunt an instrument. And therefore, I think that's why it's more politically acceptable. So I want to get really specific on what the tools of financial repression would be, again, because I think for many people, we operate with the assumption that we're actually living through a, a kind of financial repression. So I want to understand the distinction between what we've been living through and what the financial repression of, of the sort you're talking about would look like. But before we do that, I am curious to understand how this fits into the broader international financial system architecture, because it isn't... It would be a lot easier to, to make this analysis if the entire world were in one sort of nationally integrated economy with a single currency, but that's not the case. You have governments all over the world that are grossly indebted, but you have many different currencies and you have many different powers. Again, this brings us to a conversation about unipolarity versus multipolarity and, and geopolitics. So how does this express itself internationally given the fact that we have been living in a dollar de facto global financial system for the last 30 years or so? Yeah, I think many people, even people who are professional investors, if you ask them to define the global financial architecture, I think they'd really struggle. Historically, it had a name. It was called the Bretton Woods system. It was called the gold standard. It had a name. I don't think anyone's got a name for this system that we've lived through. However, Paul Volcker had a name for it, and it's in his book, Keeping At It. He used to call it the hybrid system. And he called it the hybrid system because he was used to the Bretton Woods system where everybody was linked to everybody else's currency. But the hybrid system is where some people chose to link and some people chose to float. And that's the system we've lived with. And, you know, and I cover in, my, in the book we discussed uh, last time, the Asian financial crisis, the consequences of that system, the unbalanced consequences of that system, the impacts on inequality, the impacts on too much debt. And Volcker reeled against this system. He reeled against it because he believed that we should all get in a room, we should all agree a policy, but a policy was never agreed on a multilateral level. So this was, uh, everyone focuses on the dollar at the center of this, but actually the biggest decision that's happened in the 30 years that's responsible for all of this was the, the decision by many countries, most importantly China, to link their currency to the dollar. And that is the global financial architecture, but it is one that has created these great imbalances we live with today. And of course, my argument is that those imbalances have got to such a great level, not just in terms of debt to GDP, but inequality of wealth and also the power balance between China and America, with China reaching a stage where it's quite powerful, that that old system has led to all of these imbalances and now they have to be reversed. Okay. So I do want to ask you about what this means for the status of the dollar and the future of other currencies like the renminbi. But before we do that, let's go back to the point about, or my question about the tools of financial repression and what this is going to look like. You've laid out a number of them, whether we're talking about taxes, capital controls, certain types of regulations, even rent controls. I mean, you, you laid out, I think, nine or 10 different tools of financial repression. First question, high level, is there a name for this type of a system? Have we seen a system like this used anywhere else in the world? Is this what, for example, 
the Chinese system is? Like, how do we think about what we're talking about here? Yeah. So the best way to think of this system is the post-World War II system that ran all the way to 1979 or early 1980s and focused more on Europe and that system. And that is the system that China has run. And China has been backing away from it slowly. So yes, there is the vestiges of financial repression still in China. Most other countries after World War II were coming out of that by the early 1980s into the mid 1980s. So all of those policies you mentioned are not figments of my imagination. They were all real life policies in that period after World War II and all ultimately aimed at the same aim. And the aim was to force savers to have their money in fixed interest securities at a level of interest that was below inflation. And if you do that, then you can indeed delever your economy. But this is the important bit and the difference from the last 10 years. We didn't have inflation over the last 10 years. It was an incredibly low level. So basically, you didn't really have to force people to own government bonds with a very low yield because that was pretty close to inflation, often below it, but close to it. And now we're going to have to have more compulsion. So if I make property less attractive by putting in rent controls, maybe people buy more government bond. If I put very high transaction taxes on equities and none on government bonds, maybe people buy more government bonds. If I put in capital controls to force capital to stay in the country, it's easier to force it into government bonds. So this is absolutely a rerun of that period from 45 to 79, which was much stronger in Europe than it was in the US. But even the US was getting there into the late 60s and into the early 70s. It was President Nixon who brought in price controls and wage controls. It wasn't a very left-wing government that did that in the, in the state of emergency in which America was in in the 1970s. Even the Republican Party could turn to a non-market response to the problem of inflation and turn to financial repression. So we have a very good historical period to look at to guide us through what the, how this works and what the consequences are. What is driving this inflation and what do you feel will continue to drive it? Because I think we it's clearly no, no longer transitory, but why are you convinced that it's going to be with us for the foreseeable future? So there are lots of factors in this, and some of them clearly are supply side factors. But behind all of it, there is money. And we've discussed earlier the failure of the central bankers to generate growth in money. But suddenly success in the last two years, the total amount of dollars in the world has increased by 40%. That's four zero percent We've seen nothing like that since the 1970s. Now, it is, in my opinion, deceitful to talk about inflation without talking about that. Yes, of course, there's other causes, but the root cause of it is that. And we've seen it not on that scale in Europe, not on that scale in the United Kingdom, but we've seen money creation on a much, much higher scale. So it begs the question, what suddenly worked? If they spent 10 years failing to do this, what suddenly worked? And what suddenly worked is this interference in the commercial banking system, underwriting commercial bank loans. The government came along and said for the COVID loans, make these loans, make them today, and we will underwrite all your losses. So suddenly banking is transformed because these are loans on which you cannot lose any money. And therefore, loans start getting made and money starts getting created. And the fundamental reason to believe that this is the new normal is that the government's like this. They've discovered not only can it create more growth and more inflation, it's incredibly politically powerful to push credit to where you want it to be to get reelected. So I'll give you one practical example of that. I mean, after the COVID loans, the government of the United Kingdom is back to 600 million sterling loan to Jaguar Land Rover to make green vehicles. So suddenly we have an increase in bank credit and an increase in the money supply to fund a green investment. And this is put forward as a great and necessary intervention by the state to promote green production and reduce the risk of climate disaster. Now, I can give you about six emergencies that a government might want to try and stop at the minute, a national security emergency. We might need to use bankers to fix that problem. We have a health emergency that lingers, particularly in emerging markets. We might need to use bankers to fix that problem. We have an inequality emergency, which has political repercussions and needs to be solved. We have an emergency because we're going into a Cold War with China, which I'm sure we will discuss in more detail. And to some extent, we have an emergency in the rise in labor prices, and you might need to do more investment and more capital to 
to cope with that. So the reason, the structural reason for thinking we're entering a new world of inflation is that the governments will use the bankers to fund all of these things through sticks and carrots, not necessarily ownership. But in doing so, you create a lot of money. And that takes us back into that post-World War II period where there's a lot of money being created and therefore there's a lot of inflation being created. And supply side restrictions will come and they will go. But behind it at all times, there will be this higher level of the growth in money, which is a political imperative to meet political goals, but also to create a higher level of inflation. Maybe not the current level, a lower level, but much higher than we've been used to for the past 30 years. I've heard you talk about this age of emergencies often. And it's something I actually want to understand a little bit better. However, I also want to try and articulate what I think your view is so that I'm sure that I understand it and so that listeners understand it. It seems to me that what you're basically saying is that inflation is here for a variety of structural reasons and that because of the imperatives of the state, the fact that the state at the ultimately has power and prioritizes its own existence and its own needs above anything else, it will steer that inflation through policy and through guarantees, et cetera, in areas that it deems to be less vital and will prioritize credit to areas of the economy that it thinks are most important. Is that generally correct? That is correct. And I can think of no better example of that than a speech by President Macron of France on the 17th of March, so just a few weeks ago, in which he specifically outlined a French government industrial policy, that there would be sections of the industrial society that the the state would be involved in, the state would finance, and the state would play a role in, in running. Now, that is a revolution because for a generation, we've been backing away from that. And Macron was elected, actually, to do the reverse of that. But for reasons of geopolitics, particularly reliance, reliance not so much on Russia, but reliance on China, We are doing that. And I think people can see it, but they don't ask the question, what does it mean for finance? And what it means for finance is just as you said, is that the government steers savings because that's what finance is. It's somebody's savings. It steers them to where they want them to be. So not necessary to benefit the government. I mean, they're doing it for genuine reasons. They believe that France should be less reliant upon China, but they steer that credit. Now, that could be bank credit or it can be the money you have in a bond fund. That's another form of credit. But yeah, more government intervention to push that where they wanted to be. Look, what is the story of the US economy in particular for the last 30 years? Anybody who wants credit could get it. Mm -hmm. Dogs were offered credit cards. And in a new system, that doesn't work that way. There's a degree of rationing involved here in which the state plays a role in prioritizing who gets credit. Now, historically, they've not been very good at that. But that's not going to stop them from doing it. So is another way of thinking about this that We've been living in a world where prices have been relatively low or stable, and the cost of credit has been low, relatively low and stable. In other words, the price of money. And we're moving into a world now where prices are getting increasingly out of control. They're, again, we have inflation for the first time, meaningful inflation for the first time in 30 or 40 years. And the tool of the government for financial repression will be who can get access to money and at what price? So favored industries and state champions, I mean, that's another question, which is, are we going to see state champions in Western countries will be able to access credit at cheaper prices than everybody else, which means that there will be parts of society that will be more financially repressed than others as a result of discriminant government policy. Absolutely. And I think it's not too difficult to work out who is what we might call the naughty list, who doesn't get credit going forward. In a world where credit grows faster than GDP, it is axiomatic that somebody is gearing up existing income streams, that they're not taking that debt capital and investing it to produce new income streams. And that is what's been going on for 30 years. You find an income stream, whether it's maybe a piece of commercial property or a corporation, and you borrow money and you gear it up, that's the job of private equity. If you are a chief executive officer, there are benefits to you from borrowing money and buying back your own equity. You're gearing up an existing income stream. And that is for a certain section of society has been a very profitable business for 30 years. And going forward, if we conclude that we want to bring debt to GDP down, and therefore we want to constrain the growth in debt, it is going to have to be rationed to the more productive and the more geopolitically necessary, particularly if we have this problem with China. So those people don't get credit. 
Now, for them, that means a re-equitization of that balance sheet, whether it's the corporate balance sheet, whether it's the private equity balance sheet. So a very different world. If I look at the world after World War II, lots of things were very, very cheap. There were huge gains to be made by borrowing money and buying very cheap assets, but nobody could borrow that money. I like the phrase, the description of British banking after World War II. It was called um, 363 banking. So you took deposits at three, you lent it at six, and then you went to the golf course at three o'clock in the afternoon. And that was British banking because there was only so much money to lend. There was a cap on the amount of credit available. So you basically ran out of your quota by lunchtime so you could be on the golf course by by three o'clock in the afternoon. So the, the list of people on the naughty step is investment banking, private equity, using debt to buy back your own equity, gearing up commercial property. These are the things which will consider to be, if I can use the words of Keynes and also Paul Krugman, the realm of the rentier. And uh, that's an old phrase, but it's a phrase that's politically charged. And it's a phrase that uh, Krugman has used again. Uh, and I think it's that class of society which will find their ability to access credit particularly restricted. So do you think we're going to see capital controls in Western countries? Yes, I do think that. I mean, the history of financial repression is really not that old. It's you know less than 100 years old or about 100 years old. So far, we haven't seen it without resort to capital controls. I mean, you need to shoot fish in a barrel here. That's what you need to do. You need to manipulate your domestic savings. And if you're going to shoot fish in a barrel, the first thing you better do is put them in a barrel. And that is what capital controls do. Even in recent times, if you think about some of the countries that have struggled with really, really excessive amounts of debt, and the three I would think of are Greece, Cyprus, but also Iceland. One of the very first tools they turned to in solving this problem, and it has to be said they solved it with huge amounts of external help, particularly Greece and Cyprus, was capital controls. So I think it could be a long time or a significant time before they come to the United States of America. But I'm sure other people are already contemplating capital controls as a way to corral what I what I like to call it is corralling savings into the killing pens of fixed interest securities. It sounds brutal. <laughs> what about nationalizations? Can we expect to see certain industries or companies nationalized? Yeah, well, the French are already talking about that. I mean, they do own most of Electricité de France anyway, but they are talking about buying the rest of it. And uh, it is interesting. Do you need to own a corporation to control it? I mean, if you regulate a corporation, you may not need to own it. So there may be new ways of doing this. So I think if nationalization in terms of buying it, yes, but running it without even owning it is now easily done through the powers of regulation. So I think we'll see a combination of both of those. I think most people listening to this will realize that ideologically, America will be behind this movement. I mean, it'll be uh, lagging in this. It's more likely to be a European phenomenon than an American phenomenon, but I think it can come to America, but it obviously comes through crisis because this would be such a huge political change for America. The last time we saw anything like that in America was the 1930s. So I don't expect it to be imminent in the US, but I think it is imminent in Europe. And Europe now has other threats. It has the threat of war. But we must never forget that it also has this threat that it's trying to create a single currency and it's failed to create that so far. So the single currency is at risk. There's a threat of war. I think Europe gets to these policies long before the United States of America does. You mentioned the 1930s. In the 1930s, I think it was 1933 that uh, Roosevelt issued his executive order confiscating private gold ownership or outlawing private gold ownership. Is that something that people should be concerned about today? And I ask that because gold doesn't play the role that it used to play in the monetary system. Yes. So that, that's absolutely right. I think if I was the government seeking to financially repress, what I need is money. So I start with the big chunks of money and trying to repress those, and then I work my way down. And if I look at the securities markets, and if I look at the institutions that I regulate, they have far, far, far more money than Americans would hold in gold. I mean, many times, I I would have to make a number up, but perhaps 100 times more than Americans would hold in gold. So maybe one day I can come after the private holdings of American gold, but there's so much easy money for me to manipulate in my life insurance funds, my corporate pension funds, my private pension funds, even perhaps getting as far as mutual funds. And gold is right at the bottom of the list. But as you point out, in 1933, that wasn't the case because the dollar was gold and gold was the dollar. They were interchangeable at at an exchange rate. So people tended to hold 
a lot more gold then. It was a form of money. And they held it. And obviously, they were holding a lot of it in 33 because they weren't concerned about inflation. And they were also concerned about bankruptcy. So the role that gold plays is just nothing compared to what it was before. So they'll go through regulated financial institutions in pursuit of this new form of financial repression. And if they get to gold, it'll take really quite some time to get there. That's actually a great point, which is to say that finance has been institutionalized and in many ways centralized that in ways that it wasn't 100 years ago. And I guess that also speaks to what you talked about earlier when I asked you about nationalizations and the use of regulation. So is the financial industry like target number one for the use of regulation to achieve the objectives that you would try to pursue, let's say, 100 years ago through nationalizations? Yeah, I think that's right. And just on your point, I mean, this is for the British stock market, but I think at the end of World War II, roughly about 70% of the equity market in the United Kingdom was owned in the name of individuals. It would be registered in their name. And now it's about 10. And now it all runs through institutions. So if I wanted to manipulate people's savings after World War II, I didn't have this option to the same extent because so much of that wealth was held in private hands. The institutions were obviously there. America had big institutions, but they didn't dominate the system the way they dominated today. So we they have a whole new tool here through the power of regulation. It was a tool back then, but it was a smaller tool. Now it's really a very large tool indeed. And that's one of the reasons why I, you know, I recommend people to hold investments in their own names. I'm not saying that the government wouldn't come after those investments, but if it's in a regulated financial product, it's so much easier for governments to insist on where that capital should be invested and where it should flow to. This is the greatest power governments have ever had in human history over savings because we tend, all of us tend to hold our wealth in institutions which are regulated by the government. We've just never seen anything like that before. All right. So that raises two questions. But the first one is when you say in your name, what do you mean? Well, let me say that, I mean, this is awkward, but let's say you had a mutual fund with 30 holdings in it. Well, if you had them 30 holdings in your own name, I think it could be quite some time before the government would come to try and force you to sell those holdings and buy government bonds. But if they were in a mutual fund, it's a lot easier for them to pass a law or change the regulation that would force the mutual fund to sell some of those investments and own government bonds. So obviously, none of us really want to do all of that because it's quite administratively difficult. But that's what I mean about in your name. Not in a, If it's held in your name, it's not held through the intermediary of a regulated financial institution. So you preempted my second question of a couple answers back. And my question was going to be, we've talked about capital controls. Capital controls are a form of of restrictions around what you can and can't invest in. But it sounds like what you're talking about is something much broader, and then that governments are going to restrict what types of investments their citizens can or cannot be invested in. What's going to inform that? Is it going to be the same considerations that we talked about before? Key industries, in other words, industries that the government deems to be vital. And then that obviously brings us into the broader conversation that we're going to have in the second part of our of our episode, which has to do with geopolitics and the, the uh, national security dimensions of what's happening today. So the driving force is the word emergency. So a government can justify, this is an interference with private sector property rights, but a government can justify that in an emergency. And that is the emergencies I've mentioned already, whether it's health, national security because of Russia, climate emergency, inequality emergency, the word will keep coming up emergency, and this will be seen as emergency finance. And that's how you justify the interference with private sector property rights. Let me give you a practical example. I used to be on the board of a company called the Scottish Investment Trust. The chairman of that company in 1939 was sent to New York to liquidate the equities, not of that company, but of all of the savings institutions of the United Kingdom because these were denominated in foreign currency, in dollars. So the British savings institutions were handed government bonds and had to to legally hand over their foreign equities, their American equities in particular. The American equities were sold, the dollars were achieved. Only after the United Kingdom had run down all those dollars buying armaments from America did we get the Lend-Lease Programme. But America insisted that first these foreign assets were liquidated to do that. They were sold at incredibly cheap prices, by the way. So look, I'm not suggesting that we get to that extreme stage, but it's an example of just in a real emergency, how far the state can go 
to fund itself to fight a war. And you know, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that this is all about getting government finance. It's about getting green investment. It's about getting a national defense investment. It's about getting all these things. But once the government gets to the word emergency, it can move to fairly extreme measures. They, and the other, you know, Paul Krugman is already using the word rentier. You can characterize the saver as someone who is evil, as someone who has benefited immensely over the policy of the previous 30 years. And the answer to that is yes. I mean, the saver has benefited immensely over the policies of the past 30 years and the rise in gearing has pushed up asset prices, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to start to change the narrative. But I think if you start reading the newspapers, depending on which newspaper you read, Dimitri, but if you start reading the newspapers, you can see a shift in this so that the saver is being demonized. You know, it depends what name you use. I use saver and I, and I prefer saver because, you know, lots of very poor people are savers. Lots of incredibly rich people are savers. But you can change that word to capitalist if you like. You can change it and put other words against it, but it creates the uh, a greater political ability to say these people have to pay because somebody has to pay. And anyway, they've made so much money that they have to pay. And I'm not sure that's true for the average man in the street and his savings. But that doesn't really matter. And uh, that's the problem. Everybody gets caught up in these policies. It's not just the billionaires who get caught up in these policies. You know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this question. It's a very broad question, and I'm probably not going to do it justice. But, you know, just thinking about this, this concept of emergencies, all these various emergencies, and I, I totally agree with you. I mean, we've seen this in the rhetoric coming out of the power structure for years now, which is like everything is an emergency, everything's a crisis. And on the one hand, I wonder, you know, how many of these emergencies are actually independently generated? And that, again, that's also a poor framing. It's a complex system. It's everything impacts everything else. But it feels like for the most part, these are all emergencies of our own making and, and specifically emergencies of the making of the power structure. But then that makes me sort of wonder, is that just inevitable? Is that, in other words, do societies always move in these types of cyclical dynamics. There's really no reasonable way to avoid it and that we're at the tail end of this. And so whatever these emergencies are that we have identified, they are just the expedients by which governments will do what they need to do in order to prioritize their own well-being and their own survival. Yeah. Well, we have a saying, I come from uh, Ireland and we have a saying in Ireland, it depends where you start. So this is where we start. So I think there's a huge amount of path dependency. And I think it's not difficult to forecast what governments do next. And that's why I mentioned Richard Nixon. You know, Richard Nixon was not on the extreme left of politics, but he chose policies that would be considered to be extreme left wing at the minute because he was in his path dependent place where he had to, to go to. Yes, this all springs from the same place, which was we set up an unstable system after the Asian financial crisis that created great inequality of wealth created a great rise in power for China. And that struggle between two great powers is something that probably had to happen eventually. And now we're just having to live with it. So they all stem from previous policy choices and often stem from inaction, simply not being prepared to expend political capital to stop something. And when I look at finance in my career in finance, there were so many things and there are so many things which clearly had a, were of limited benefit, in my opinion. So let me just sort of put my cards on the table. I'm in favor of Adam Smith. I'm in favor of capitalism. But there have been many bits of it over the last 30 years which have been growing not just inequality, but imbalances, a structural dangerous imbalances in the system. But there was no political capital to stop it. So it was left to run. So I would say that's, you say, you ask, is this just a normal thing? And I think it is tend to be a normal thing. We go through long cycles like that where no one can stop it. Many people benefit from it. There's a certain capture of the political system by the people who benefit from it. And it runs until it becomes extreme. And then it has to reverse. And I think for many of us, we thought it would reverse after 2009. But it had one final gasp. And uh, now it's over. So now it reverses. I would just also refer people to the famous or infamous chart, depending on your opinion, in Thomas Piketty's Capital, which shows wealth distribution over the period. And uh, it looks to me like a pretty good mean reverting series. It mm. doesn't seem to me, as Piketty asserts, that it goes up and it stays up. It tends to mean revert. Now, it may mean revert because of taxation. It may mean revert because of warfare. But ultimately, it mean reverts. And therefore, it does suggest that there is a, a very long cyclical thing involved in this in, in human societies. So we're talking about a world where it's going to become very difficult by the standards that we've been used to 
to not only make money with money, but to preserve capital, to save, to be able to plan for the future. Yes, absolutely. And that was the period after World War II. My, my favorite quote after World War II was the famous British author, Evelyn Waugh, who had made a lot of money before the war, a lot of money. He was an incredibly successful author, interviewed in 1963, pleading penury, it has to be said. He was asked by the interviewer, uh, you know, what happened to all that money and what he replied, and this was into the nearly 20 years into a financial repression. What he replied was as follows. Well, no, no man in this country has made any money honestly for the past 20 years. And so I smiled a little bit. There are lots of ways to make money in a situation like this. People in my business call it arbitrage, but that may not be legal. So there were lots of ways. When governments start bringing in these restrictions, they create arbitrage opportunities. And there's a different necessity of the way business is done, but it takes people to that outer limit of what is legal and illegal. And we can see that, you know, to be clear, it's much clearer in Europe after World War II than it was in America. But even by the 70s in America, there's quite a bit of this going on and a few people end up in prison for certain, uh, let's just say, arbitrage activities in the energy market. So it, it changes the whole nature of what it is to be in business. So it's a, you know, a fascinating cultural shift as to what it is to be a businessman, to be an allocator of capital. So yes, it's much more difficult to preserve wealth, but it's also much more difficult to allocate it in a way that is going to be fruitful, but also morally correct as well. I mean, you know, that's a really big sea change in how the world works. Uh, the other one you can probably watch, and anybody who's watched uh, the movie about Harry Lyme, The Third Man, that's a pretty good example of, uh, in an extreme case, a different form of capital allocation at work. So, Russell, I'm going to move us to the second half of our conversation for premium subscribers. But before I do, I want to mention a few things. Number one, everyone should go to the episode page on the hiddenforces.io website and check out the related episodes that I will have listed for this specific podcast. They include conversations with people like Michael Pettis, Steve Keen, which was episode 12, where we talked about a debt jubilee, and exactly these types of issues. My very first conversation with Jim Grant, episode 13, and many others, they're all going to be on the website because I think it really helps to have a strong foundation to understand really how we got here. And we've devoted so many episodes over the last five years to trying to understand that. In the second half, Russell, I want to focus in on some of the things that we discussed in the first half or that I teased, as well as what asset classes, what industries might be beneficiaries in this new order, and how investors should try and think about that to position themselves. I also want to think about what the future of the European Union will look like, the future of EMU, how this impacts the global order, or rather how the global order impacts it, and what, what that new multipolar world will look like, the position of China, the renminbi, Gold, we talked about a little bit, but I want to ask it in more specific terms in the second half in terms of where gold fits in central bank balance sheets and so much more. For anyone new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Russell, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Russell, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation onto the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>